But uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, uh, verses 11, verses 11, 12, and 17 he says, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. These are people you're just passing through. You can tell when someone's like, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just passing through. I'm not from here. I don't really belong here. I am asking for kisses at Burger King. And it's just not, it's very clear that uh, this guy does not like, he doesn't fit in. And uh, that's what he's saying. It's an identity statement real quick. He's saying, Look, you shouldn't, you, you, you shouldn't look the same. You should look different. You should live different. And this is the premise that he's coming through, through, through this passage. He says, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, your identity is not built here. It's built in heaven. To abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, pagans being people who just don't believe, who, who aren't believers in Jesus, uh, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Then skip down to verse 17. It kind of summarizes up 13 through 16. And he says four things. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And uh, he makes my sermon really easy. Because he's just got the four points right there, right? This is, this is nice. But uh, he emphasizes at the beginning, it's, it's similar to Hebrews 11, where it talks about uh, the hall of faith. And you have all these people who just throughout history have been faithful followers of God. And, in, and it emphasizes, and it says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth our identity is not built here i'm not my goal isn't to fit in here my goal is to look different and i love the niv subtitle to this section it says living godly lives in a pagan society and that's where we're at right now i don't know if you guys look at the world around us and if you look and you go man this looks like heaven your picture of heaven is is way too small Right there is there's so much mess going on around us these days, and uh, it only seems to continue to multiply on itself anymore. And Second uh, Corinthians five twenty talks about this. It says we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making His appeal through us. What is it? So he, the the purpose of the church of Christians, of people who are following Him, what He's saying is we are called. God is appealing to those who don't know him and saying, you want to get to know what it's like to be with me? Look at my followers. Look at the people who, and, and I got to be honest, guys. I don't know how well the church is doing at this. I don't know how well we actually live different and stand out in the right ways. And it's scary to me if I was to say that, and it breaks my heart that when I talk to people who don't know Jesus, and, and I say, do you want to, and they're like, what is it like? What do you mean? What is this faith supposed to be like? What is Christianity supposed to be like? What is following Jesus supposed to be like? And, and, I, and, and I have to start with, please just don't look at most Christians. Please, like, can you take that, can you push that aside? Because that's not, like the picture that we get is just so broken. It's just so, and uh, Gandhi said, I like your Christ. I don't like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. And I think the world is proclaiming the same thing. Just going, man, I don't, I don't really mind Jesus. I think he's, I, 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 I think about a friend of mine who I talked to this week and she's wrestling with so many different things and and she is she's 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 wrestling with her faith and she's really wrestling with man how I see the church and how I see Christians act towards my gay uncle and act towards my black friends and act towards the 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 people that are in different socioeconomic s statuses than than what they are I just it's, 
it's broken. It's not right. She's like, I, I'm, man, I, I question it. And then I question my faith with my family and I get condemned for it. And I question my faith with my non-believing friends. And I gotta be honest, I feel a lot more loved and listened to and valued in those conversations. That just breaks my heart. And, uh, and so this is uh, ver where verse 12, he talks about, and, and Peter says, live such good lives among the pagans that, those, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your Facebook posts and, oh no, no, sorry, sorry. They may see how many times you win your arguments and, no, hold on. They may see how morally upright you are and how, how no, no. They may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, this is not talking about moral uprightness. This is not talking about being perfect. Actually, what it talks about, this word here is uh, kalos. And good here actually means beautiful, lovely, attractive. Not talking about like, man, I see that you're so like morally great and you do good and, 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 and you're just nice and you seem so perfect and you see, no, but man, you are attractive. I look at you and I go, man, I want what they're having, right? Do you know we were called to be attractive we're called as Christians to, to, to follow God in a way that actually makes people look at the church and go, I want that. I want that. But in the world that we're living today, it's really, it's really hard to say that the church is actually doing that. In fact, there's a lot more apologizing going on than, than, than actually uh, I I exclaiming and going, man, this is so good. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer says this quote. He says, your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. Let me say that again. Your life as a Christian should make non-believers question their disbelief in God. And we're trained here. This, this passage is talking about living our lives through the lens of the lost. Live our lives through the lens of the lost. What, what, is, what is the world thinking? What is the world seeing right here? And he gives four encouragements for how we are to do this, how we are to live different in a way that's not just different for the sake of different, not just, uh, not, not just standing out for the sake of standing out, but different and attractive. They may see how attractive it is to go, man, I want what they're drinking. I want what they're having. I want, I, I want that. Whatever they got, I want it. And he says four different things. Verse 17, show proper respect to everyone, love the family of believers, fear God, and honor the emperor. And uh, I actually, this is the New International Version, and I really like how the ESV and a couple other translations take this. So the Bible was not originally written in English. may surprise you, uh, this uh, particular book was written in Greek thousands of years ago, uh, almost 2,000 years ago. And uh, this is the, the word here for... Uh, show proper respect is tamao, and it means to attribute high status to someone by honoring. So I really like the word honor as opposed to respect, because to me, I see honor. When, when, when I think about respect, I think about I grew up playing sports, and uh, how do you how, how do you lead? In, on the football field? How do you lead on the basketball court? How do you lead on the wrestling mat and the track? Wh wherever you're at, you create output. You build respect. You don't have to be a great leader. You don't have to be a nice person. You, you, you produce. The best, the, the, the quarterback that completes the most passes and gets the most yards and scores the most points, that is the quarterback that everybody respects more. Respect is built off of action. You earn respect, right? Man, I really respect Pastor Mike's heart for the church because I see the way that he loves you guys. I see the way that he acts. I see the way that he's so faithful. I really respect JJ's understanding of scripture because I see his, uh, his, his, his degree. I 
see the way that he dives into it. Man, I see all this and, and respect is earned. Honor is commanded. Respect is optional. Honor is not. Honor everyone. And this word actually comes from the root of this idea of a price or value. And so attribute to them the value, but it's a heavenly value. It's a value that how, how, how does God value the person that you're talking to? How does God value your neighbor? How does God value the, and, and I think about uh, some people, I attribute higher value than others naturally in my flesh. And this is wrong. This is, this is judgment and this is, this is selfish of me. And in what I, and there's, there's some people that are harder for me to honor than others. I'm reminded of a guy who, uh, who I had talked to and this dude was not clean. This dude had, uh, was, I, I, I don't know if, uh, what what mental disorder he had, but he was uh, he 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 was living in some assisted facility. He's about forty, but he was he was he never never bathed. He loved uh, to chew tobacco and not in the packs, but just like in it, he had all over his teeth and it, and it would be dripping down his face sometimes. And 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 he didn't really know a personal bubble very well, right? So he'd come to you and he'd be about 12 to 18 inches away as he's talking. And, you, and I'm talking to him and I'm like, breathe through my mouth, breathe through my mouth. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. And, uh, and there was one time and every time, and every time I talked to him, I, I, God gave me the opportunity to transition from what I see as valuable to what he sees. Because what, what does God look at when he, created, when he creates man, when he looks at people? He says the same thing that he said in Genesis 2. He says, very good. Very good. The value that I see on that person, man, I, they're so valuable. I, I'd give my son for them. That's the value that God puts. That's how God honors. And that's the value that we need to put on the people around us. And so when he's talking to me, and I don't remember what he said, but I remember him going, uh, given, given a hard P or a hard T in one of his statements and and I had, I had like spit and tobacco on my face. And this was the moment when God was like, how are you going to honor? Because all I wanted to do was buy, you know, and beeline to the, to the bathroom and run and wash my face. And, uh, but, but he was going, man, how, how do I get connected here? How do I, uh, at, at, at this church and how do, where, where do I serve? Where can I? And so I'm in, and, and, and so God <laughs> humbled me in this time and, uh, and, and, he, and I ended up staying with him for a couple extra minutes and, and talking and taking him to a wall and going, hey, here's some different ways that you can get connected. I don't think this would, des- would, would necessarily fit what you're looking for. Here, here are some areas that I think you would be able to serve here. You would be able to find a place here. And then I beelined it to the bathroom. And uh, it is, but God taught me, God has to teach us how to honor and that's not like the end all lesson, man, I still, I still mess up on this all the time. And then the other interesting Greek word for everyone actually means everyone. It actually, it just, it's, it is every single person. How do you honor someone and show them respect? I find Look at love languages, if you guys know those, uh, acts of service, words of affirmation, giving gifts. Uh, I think one of the best ways is to listen. Let's listen to someone. In fact, in, in, in the race relation stuff that we've been talking about and that we've been seeing around us for the past couple months, one of the great things that I think is coming up from this is this heart to shh, 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 just listen, just listen. Stop combating, stop saying, ah, no, well, I haven't seen it. Ah, no, well, but shh, just, just listen. And don't listen to rebuttal, listen to understand. And so listening doesn't mean shut up and don't say anything. Listen sometimes means extra feedback. Hold on, what do you mean by that? Sorry, uh, are you saying, this is how I'm hearing you. Is this what you're saying? Because I wanna, I wanna understand you. I wanna understand your heart. I wanna understand where you're coming from. 
I think listening is one of the best ways to honor people. I think celebrating, encouraging, and recognizing, and, and actually using words to, to emphasize the value that, they, that God has for them, not even the value that they have for them. How are we called to love everyone? This is an emphasis on the people who are not in our body of believers. This is an emphasis on the people who don't know Jesus, on the people who don't see what it's like to be within the church, and this is their glimpse. Honor everyone. That's different, right? That's different from this world. Here's another one. Love the brotherhood. This is talking about agape love, which is unconditional, and it emphasizes action, actually performing, actually doing, not just I feel love, but I do love. I love people. John 13, 35 says, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another. He said, Jesus says, I'm gonna give the world a test. They can judge you, not by your perfection, not by uh, your, your, your ability to defend yourself, not by... And, by the way that you love each other. Yet so many times I find that we're in conflict. How are we loving? Are we loving each other in a way that's like, whoa, that's different. The world goes, holy smokes. That's, that's way more sacrificial than anything I'm, I'm familiar with. Why do you live like that? Why, do you, why, why are you helping that person that you just met two weeks ago in your church? And why, why, why are you meeting up with, why are you doing this? Why are you inviting that person into your home? Why are you letting that person live with you? Why are you, man, there's, there is this love for the believers. It's like uh, uh, being in enemy territory as a Husker fan, right? And when you see, when, when I'm walking around uh, Colorado, Iowa, Oklahoma, someplace like that, and, and, and I'm seeing, and, and I see all these, these team colors around me, and I'm not seeing a whole lot of red. And then suddenly, I see someone with a big block red N on their shirt. And what do we do? Yeah, go Big Red. Come on, we're high-fiving. We're like, I don't know what just happened, but we became best friends, like immediately, just like that. In the same way, we should be that way with our fellow believers, like not just here, but walking out and we go, oh my goodness, you're not just like a, you know, I'm a Christian. I wore a WWJD bracelet when I was in seventh grade. It was great. Like, but, uh, but, but really go, man, you you love Jesus. This is so cool. There's this automatic camaraderie and automatic love that just, that should just spark. That should just happen immediately. Love the brotherhood because that's different. That's just it's 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 totally different. How how why do you all of a sudden, man? Like you just you you built that out of nowhere with that person. That's that's weird. That's different. The conflict that we have, not not having conflict, but doing conflict right, right? We're going to have conflict. How are you handling conflict with your brothers and sisters in Jesus right now? How are you choosing to understand them, to listen to them, to forgive them, and to fight for that connection? Man, how... We, we got to live different. Here's another one. Fear God. I love this one. Peter's just... Uh, we, one thing I notice about this, a lot of times when we say fear God, we, we say, now it's not like being afraid, it's more like reverence. And yes, I agree with that, but I think we also have to get to the root of not being afraid, but yes, it's still fear. Because if you talk about psychologically what fear is, fear is a key uh, actual emotion that we have. It's a foundational emotion, and we are, it's, it's the best immediate motivator in us. When, when we go, man, you need, the dentist says you need to brush your teeth or else you're going to get cavities and they're going to fall out and it's going to hurt, right? What do we do? Okay, I'm going to brush my teeth because I fear the cavities and teeth falling out and it hurting, right? 
When we get ready in the morning, we put on deodorant because we fear the stench that we could give to the people that we're walking by, right? When we, when, there, there's so many different things that we do. When we work hard at work because we fear what the boss is gonna say, we fear getting fired, we fear, fear getting passed up by the, that other coworker that's, that's killing it and we wanna do really well. Fear is, a, fear is a motivator. And here's the thing, the Bible doesn't say don't fear. The Bible says, fear God. In fact, fear, fearing God is one of the key uh, identifiers of people who follow God boldly throughout all of scripture, Old Testament, New Testament. And it says, man, what is it? What is it? It's, it's they're motivated by God. My motive is not, oh man, I'm afraid what other people are going to think. Oh man, I'm afraid of fitting in here. Oh man, I'm afraid of, of what this is going to do. Oh man, I'm afraid of, of, of my job, of my boss, of my friend, of my coworker, of my neighbor, of, 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 of the social and the uh, cultural uh, pressures around me and said, no, my motive, my fear is in God. Man, what would happen if I don't live different? What would happen if I'm not intentionally standing out in a way that, that people can look out to the crowd and they can follow people and they go, different, different, different. They're acting, they're living. What they carry about them is just, I want that. What would happen? What kind of pressure is, 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 is in, if that is our motive how would we live? How do we live different? I think fear is uh, the, the key here when we see fear God. Don't look at, uh, look, look just as much as what you're told to fear as what you're not told to fear. I'm not. It doesn't say fear everyone, fear the brotherhood, fear the emperor. It doesn't any of that. It says fear God. I'm not afraid of the, the people around me. I'm not afraid of the politics and what's going on around me. I'm not afraid of what the governor may say about masks. I'm not afraid about what, what any type of decision or political statement is going to be made. I'm not afraid about my boss. I'm not afraid of, I'm, I'm motivated by God. And I know he's got me. Last one is honor the emperor. Whew. Man, there is uh, there's a lot that we can, that we can get in on this one, right? Um, and this is regardless. So, in, in in our application, this would clearly be the precedent. But we what we talk about here in in verses 13, 14, 15, 16, it talks about honoring your governors, honoring your your everybody, not just the emperor, but and then it says. This is your motive. Your, 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 your heart is to honor them because God has placed them there to judge those who do wrong and to grant, uh, grant justice to those who do wrong and uh, goodness for those who do right. And uh, man, it is, he, Peter must have been living in a pretty great time, huh? Where the, where the emperor must have been doing that pretty well, right? In reality, he was living under Caesar Nero's reign. And what, they're about a year away. Uh, this, this letter's written about a year before. There's already persecution going on, but some of the greatest persecution in the church starts about a year after this letter's penned. And Nero uh, is, is looking for someone to blame for a city fire. And uh, what does he blame? He blames Christians. And so he covers them in tar while they're still alive and sets them on fire to light his garden uh, during the night. And this is, this is the world that, that they're communicating to. And in fact, they're also living in this time of uh, kingship deity where you have to declare, you go in order to have any semblance of religious freedom, you have to go once a year uh, to, to the king and you have to uh, offer some incense and declare Caesar is Lord. And then you're given a piece of paper that says, okay, now you can worship whoever you want beyond that. 
And for a polytheist, for someone who worships lots of gods, it's like, whatever, not a big deal. For an atheist, it's like, okay, I'll say it. It doesn't matter. But for a Christian going, they, they would have to walk up and say, Caesar is not Lord. Jesus is my Lord. He is the one who's in charge of my life. I don't make the decisions I make. I make the, I make the decisions God would make for my life. And that's how I live. And I'll, th- this, is, this is a lifestyle that's completely different. And what... what would the persecution that would come to the church because of that decision is beyond anything that we're facing today. And so if, if we have a problem, if we can't honor in our context, the problem is not our context, the problem is our honor. Remember, honor is different from respect. No one earns my honor, I give it. I have friends that are posting, man, I agree with this, I disagree with this about the, uh, the, the political decisions. And I don't think that's not even in the, on the same page that Peter's writing about. That's not even in the same book. It is this concept of going, hey, you know what? We honor and we respond according to our faith, to our fear of God. So back to verse 12. The whole purpose of all of this is not, uh, in, in, in fact, you see in chapter 5, verse 13, you see a couple different things. You see that uh, the God, that actually Peter's purpose for this passage, for this entire book, is not condemnation. It is not uh, even, it's not even correction, He's not saying, man, there's, there's something wrong that you guys are doing and I want you guys to fix it. It is encouragement is what he says. So I want to finish with the same way. This is what verse 12 lives such good lives, really what it's saying, that non-believers can't help but glorify God. And ask ourselves, man, I got to ask myself, do I live in a way that people go, I want that. Not only in a way that is different, but in a way that is attractive and going, wow, they're really free. They aren't burdened by the fear and by the hate and by the anger and by all all the things that, that I'm burdened with and that I see in so many other people around Titus 2.10 talks about this, says, in every way, make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. How are we representing Jesus as ambassadors, as foreigners? How are we surrendering our desires? And I want this to be an encouragement, even more than a correction. Because He's so worth it. He's so good. And he's saying, man, I'm not saying you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm saying you got this. I'm just directing you. I'm just giving you a little bit. I'm I'm giving you some boundaries to run on this path. Do it. And I want to do the same thing for you guys. I see people in here that already God has, has, has empowered you to live different, to live boldly, to live in ways that's like, hold hold on, what? You do what? That's, why? Why do you do that? Why do you live that way? Why do you continue to forgive? Man, I, I, I know what that person did to you. Yeah, when you talk about them, I don't hear hate. Now, Forgiveness and trust and closeness are different, but man, we should not, we should not be ones that, that we're defined by what we hate, by what we disagree with, yet so much of Christianity is. I love the mission here at Full Life. It says, helping people become passionate followers of Jesus. And passion is great, but passion without expression is just opinion. Passion with expression is mission. Man, I'm passionate and I let it intervene in my life and people are gonna see it. People are gonna see this.
And I want to offer a couple different things. First of all, I want you guys to think about, uh, man, what is it that I'm, that how, how can I live radically, attractively different? And I think one thing, I love what the team developed here. Oh, here we go. Uh, I love what the team developed here with the spiritual disciplines. I think these are some things. I think there, there's some stuff on here with meditation, with fellowship, with Sabbath, making some of these decisions and going, you know what, I am going to define, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live different. Wait, why are you doing that? Why? What's the, what? That's different. In fact, if we look at scripture, the key source of evangelism for, for the vast majority, you have people like Paul, you have people like Peter, you have people that, that, are, that are evangelists and that go out and then you have people they have the rest of the church that is called to live so radically different from the world that it stands out and is just like, whoa, I want that. I want that. So I want to take some time today. What is, I, I, I want for us to pray and I want for us to, to go, man, what God, what are you calling me to? But specifically to those of you, if someone's in this room on the screen, I want to give you guys an opportunity. I want to say the same thing that I said at the beginning. Please, when looking at Jesus and following him, please don't look at the majority of the church. Please don't look at the majority of the Christians around you. Please look at this and go, man, if, if, if there's something broken that you see and you go, man, I, I, I want Jesus. And I don't want to become a judgmental harsh, angry Christian, I want Jesus. I want to give you guys an opportunity to respond. If we can stand real quick. We're going to step into a time of worship. And during this, I just want to say, man, if that's, if that's you and you go, man, I want, I want Jesus. I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to make, and, and he's the one who I'm going to follow. I want, can we, I just want to call out for boldness and for living a little bit different and to start it off right now. If you want to raise your hand or if you want to comment on the Facebook page, would you just say something? I want Jesus. Come on, come on, come on, come on. And keep your hand up. This is your first time. This is your first time. I want you to raise your hand real high. If you go, man, I want Jesus right now, and I'm going to change my life. I'm, I'm doing something new. Come on. I see your hands. Thank you. Thank you. And what we're going to do, I, I want to have, if we can get, uh, we're going to have some time just on the sides over here. If we can get Pastor JJ, if we can get some of the, the pastors here to come up to the side. If you guys want to make your way up, because we want to celebrate with you. We want to, come on, make your way up and uh, meet with Pastor JJ. This is going to be an opportunity for us to be able to walk this out. I mean, for the rest of us, we're gonna go, man, how am I? How am I gonna live different? God, right now, I just pray over every person. I pray over every person in this room that we would live so radically, attractively different. God, that we would not be defined That we, as, as we look back at our Facebook posts, as we look back at our conversations, as we look back at the way that we've talked in the grocery stores, in the diners, God, at the coffee shops, God, wherever we may be, that we go, man, Am I known for my love or am I known for my judgment? And that we would transition that. We would be so known for how we honor, how we love, how we fear God, and how we respect our authorities, God. I, I pray that you would call us to something new. You would call us to something greater. Challenge us and encourage us, God. Come on. So much good. I just want to declare the love of God over you guys. Man, there is so much that God has for you guys. He's challenging you to something bigger, challenging you to something better. And he's like, I got you. I'm with you. I'm behind you. I'm encouraging you. You're not doing this alone. You're in this with me. And we're in this all together. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I praise you. Would we leave forever different? In Jesus' name we pray.